This talk is about a new microarchitectural side channel attack on a CPU ring interconnect. One thing we have learned over the past decade is that microarchitectural side channel attacks are important. These attacks allow to bypass isolation, steal or exfiltrate sensitive data, or even, in the worst case, leak the entire program memory. These attacks have been shown to be practical, and it is only a matter of time before we will start to see them exploited in the wild. So what can we, defenders, do today to block microarchitectural side-channel attacks? Let's look at a commercial microprocessor available on the market today. There are three main things that we can do to block microarchitectural side-channel attacks. The first one is to disable simultaneous multi-threading across security domains. The second one is that we can cleanse the microarchitectural state across context switches. And the third one is that we can partition the shared last-level cache. Now, are we safe? The motivating question to this work was, what about the ring interconnect? The ring interconnect is this component of the processor that allows different cores and last-level cache slices to communicate with each other. This component hasn't been exploited in the past for microarchitectural side-channel attacks for two main reasons. The first one is that very little is known about how it works. And the second one is that it's a very coarse-grained resource. So up until today, it wasn't clear whether side-channel attacks on this component were even possible. In this talk, we address for the first time both of these challenges. The first part of the talk will be reverse engineering during interconnect to reveal how it works in practice. And the second part of the talk will be on building attacks that exploit contention on the ring interconnect. Let's start from the first part. How did we go about reverse engineering the ring interconnect? The first question we asked ourselves was, is traffic on the ring interconnect susceptible to contention? And to answer this question, we took a real CPU and started running experiments on it. In particular, we built two processes, a receiver and a sender. The receiver takes as an input a core and a slice, RC and RS. It pins itself to the given core, and it starts timing loads from the target slice. While the sender also receives as an input a sender core and a sender slice, SC and SS. But instead of timing these loads, it just issues many of them bombarding the target slice with many loads. Now, what we did is that we tried every possible combination of RC, RS, SC, and SS to observe under which configurations contention occurs. Initially, the results from running these experiments were not very intuitive. So we broke them down in a number of observations. And in the next few slides, I will present to you these observations and later show you how you can use them to build attacks. The first observation that we made is that when the receiver slice and the sender slice are the same, we always see contention, regardless of the course. The reason why this is the case is that there is contention on the slice's input and on the slice's output. And this is different from traditional side channel attacks because we made sure that the sender and the receiver are targeting different cache sets. The second observation that we made is that when the receiver is loading from the slice closest to its core and the sender is loading from a different slice, then there is never contention. To understand this behavior, I need to introduce the concept of a ring stop. Ring stops are routers that allow different cores and slices to interface with the ring interconnect. In uh, modern Intel CPUs, each core shares the ring stop with the closest slice. And so what we saw here is an example where traffic between each core and the local slice doesn't interfere with traffic that crosses that ring stop. The third observation that we made is that uh, when the sender and the receiver are loading in different directions, then we never see contention. And the reason why this is the case is that the ring interconnect is, well, actually it is a ring, and it has two different flows, one that goes from right to left and one that goes from left to right. And when the sender and the receiver are loading in different directions, they simply use different physical flows. A consequence of this observation is that ring stops can inject and receive packets from both directions simultaneously. The next observation that we made is that when the sender and the receiver issue traffic that travels over non-overlapping segments of the ring interconnect, then there is never contention. And the reason why this is the case is that traffic on the ring interconnect only travels through the shortest path. So if the sender and the receiver use different paths, they do not affect each other. So far, we saw that for the sender and the receiver to contend on the ring interconnect, their traffic needs to travel in the same direction and on overlapping segments. Surprisingly, however, these conditions are not enough. So in the next few slides, I will describe the additional necessary conditions to observe contention on the ring interconnect. Before I tell you these conditions, I need to tell you a bit more about how the ring interconnect is implemented. 
In particular, on modern Intel CPUs, there are actually four rings. There is a data ring, an acknowledge ring, a request ring, and a snoop ring. During an LLC hit, we only use the data ring, the request ring, and the acknowledging. But for the sake of this talk, I would only focus on the request and the data ring. For example, when the receiver is on core 2 and it wants to read some data from slice 5, it will have to issue a request that travels on the request ring all the way to slice 5. And the same way, when the slice has to send some data back to the core, it will have to send this data through the data ring. The next piece of information which is crucial to understanding contention on the ring interconnect is the distributed arbitration policy. This arbitration policy can be summarized with a sentence saying that traffic already on the ring always has priority over new traffic. And you can see here an example where the receiver envelops the sender, meaning that the path used by the sender is a subset of the path used by the receiver. In this case, we, are not, we observe that the receiver never sees contention. An intuitive way to think about the distributed arbitration policy is to think about the ring interconnect as a train going along with boxcars. A ring stop that wants to inject a packet into the ring needs to wait for a free boxcar. Contention happens when the ring stop wants to inject a packet, but there are no free boxcars, and so it has to wait for a free boxcar to arrive. In the example of this slide, since the train is traveling counterclockwise, then the receiver always has priority, both on the request ring and on the data ring, and so there is never contention. Finally, we saw that even with all the conditions discussed so far, it was not always the case that there was contention. And the reason for this is that each ring is actually divided into two lanes. In this slide, you can see we made one lane colored in black and one lane colored in blue. Traffic that is destined to a core or a slice that is black travels on the black lane. However, traffic that is destined to cores or slices that are blue travels on the blue lane. And only when the sender and the receiver are using the same lanes, we can actually see contention. In the slides attached to this talk, you can find some examples for cases when there is contention due to sharing the lane versus not sharing the lane. So in the first part of this talk, we saw that for contention to occur on the ring interconnect, the sender and the receiver need to issue traffic that travels in the same direction, on overlapping segments, on the same lane, and that the sender has priority over the receiver. Before I move on with part two of this talk, I want to bring up three additional observations. The first one is that when the sender and the receiver contend on more than one ring, then there is more contention. The second one is that we observe that when the sender misses in the last travel cache, then it generates additional traffic flows, which cause additional contention. And in the paper, we provide every single detail about how these uh, flows occur and why. And the third observation is that when the prefetchers are on, which is the default configuration, then the contention is amplified. I encourage you to check the paper to find details about these and other observations. But now we're ready to move on to part two. So in this part, I will talk about a covert channel and a side channel attack that we built using the findings from the first part of the talk. Let's start from the covert channel. The high-level idea of the covert channel is to have two processes, a sender and a receiver. They are normally not authorized to communicate with each other, but they're still trying to exchange information. And the way they can do this is that they can set themselves up so that contention is guaranteed to occur on the ring interconnect. And then they can use this as a channel to transmit zeros and ones, and then arbitrary information. You can see here an example where the sender is sending to the receiver a sequence of alternating ones and zeros. And you can see how easy it is for the receiver to tell when there is a one, namely a peak of contention, versus when there is a zero, which is just a valley with no contention. To compare the performance of our covert channel with the one of prior work, we use the channel capacity metric, which takes into account both the bandwidth and the error rate. On both our CPUs, we were able to achieve channel capacities that exceed 3 megabits per second, making our attack the fastest to date for attacks that do not rely on shared memory. Let's now move on to the first side channel attack against cryptographic code. I want to be very upfront about it. Here we are targeting code that is known to be vulnerable to side channel attacks. However, our attack is the first one to show that this code leaks specifically over the ring interconnect channel. Now, the goal of the attacker, given this pseudocode, is to detect the execution of E2. Because if E2 executes, that means that the bit is equal to 1. So let's consider the first iteration of this victim loop, starting from a cold cache. So no code and data is cached when this iteration starts. So what happens is that uh, the victim will uh, start the loop, and uh, at the very beginning of an iteration, it will call E1. E1 is a function, and it will have to load some code and data all the way from DRAM into the cache, which will use the ring interconnect. Now, there are two cases. If the bit is equal to 1, then the victim will call E2, and E2, again, will miss in the cache, and this will cause the CPU to bring data from DRAM all the way to the cache 
causing ring interconnect utilization. However, if the bit is equal to zero, then E2 is just skipped. And this means that the victim will jump to the next iteration of the loop, but since E1 was just called, E1 will hit again, and therefore the ring interconnect is not utilized. So by observing the ring interconnect temporal trends of contention, the attacker might be able to infer whether E2 executed or not, and therefore infer the bit. In the paper, we provide many more details about how this approach can be generalized also to multiple iterations. But for now, I want to show you the results of using this attack against the RSA square multiply routine. As you can see from these plots, an attacker can tell whether the bit was 1 or 0 by looking at the right-hand side of the plots. The right-hand side of these plots are when uh, E2 is uh, executed or E1 is executed again. And as you can see, when the bit is equal to 1, then there is a distinguishable peak of ring contention. This peak is so distinguishable that when we train that as an SVM classifier to use single traces to infer the bit, we achieved an accuracy that was 90%. And in the paper, we show the same attack also against CDDSA. Lastly, I want to move on to our second set channel attack, which is an attack against keystroke processing. The goal of this attack is to infer when the victim is pressing a key, which can later be used to infer passwords or other sensitive input that is typed by a user. So the question is, does processing keystrokes cause distinguishable patterns of ring contention that an unprivileged process can detect? And we answer this question in the affirmative. Not only a receiver can monitor the ring interconnect utilization and detect when keystrokes are pressed, but also this uh, detection works even in the presence of noise. And I really encourage you to read the paper to find more details about how this works. To conclude my talk, I also want to point out that we made the source code of every experiment that we run on this paper available as open source on GitHub, and I really encourage you to check it out. Thank you for your attention.